Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. I'm going to try something. Okay, I'm going to try to do this by memory. And I'm doing this for my own benefit. I'm just telling you all this, okay? These, these verses that we've been studying. But I'm doing this. I, I encourage you guys. It's not like you have to memorize Scripture, okay? Just understand that. You don't have to do that for God to love you. It is for your benefit. Surely by now, though, as long as we've been camping out in Ephesians, maybe y'all have memorized a verse or two, I would hope, you know. Um, This is certainly a section of the Scripture that would be beneficial to you to keep in mind and to stay fresh on it. But he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Am I good so far? Verse 13, no, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Then verse 13, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Am I close enough there? And having done a wherefore, I thought it, I I knew that I was going to miss the wherefore. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness. Am I good so far? Did I miss anything? Huh? Okay, keep me honest. Uh, Let's see, that was verse 14. Now verse 15, so we had the belt of truth, then we had the breastplate of righteousness. And then, uh, let's see, we got, oh, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Am I good so far, Rita? And now verse 17. Right? Verse 17, take the... Helmet of salvation, right? Is it take? Yep, and take the helmet of salvation. That's where we're going to look at today. We're going to camp out verse 17. I give myself about an 80 there, Rita. That's a, that's a low B. That's a low B. You can do it. You can do it. Now, now listen. So here's a, and this is just a little quick side lesson, okay? I promise you this. If you take this stuff in little chunks like I've been doing it, one little sentence at a time, seems like we spend two weeks on a word, right, Gene? You do that, I promise. That stuff starts to sink in. I was talking to uh, Beverly about this, you know, about writing notes. I know a lot of y'all write notes. You know, and the reality is you'll probably never look at those notes again. But, you know, the old phrase is an inch of ink is worth a mile of memory. And so do what you can. Employ what strategies you can to help uh, internalize this stuff. Break it down. Um, think on every word. And, and over time, you too can start to do that. And, and it becomes more effective for you. So this helmet... All right, so so far we've looked at four pieces of armor in the order of importance that's outlined in Scripture. So that first piece of armor that's listed there is what? That truth, okay? Having your loins girt about with the truth. So people call it the belt of truth, the girdle of truth, whatever the case is. And then secondarily, we have the breastplate of righteousness. After that, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel piece. Now remember... A lot of people say that sword of the Spirit or the Word is the offensive weapon in the list. I tend to disagree with that. I think having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace is the most offensive weapon in the sense that it is the forward advancing thing. Your feet are what moves you forward and keeps you going to those places where the lost people are. At work, could be at home, could be you know at the grocery store, wherever it may be, your feet are taking you there. And, and the lesson there is you're to be prepared with the gospel because that is where you have the impact, is in the marketplace. Um, it may be at a family reunion, but it's where you go forward. Okay? And so it's very, it's very offensive. It's, it's, it's more of an offensive posture in that sense than just standing waiting. Okay? And then after that, uh, after having our feet shot with preparation of the gospel of peace, last week we talked about that shield of faith. And remember we talked about it's not just our faith, what we deem something true. It is the faith, the system of doctrine that we learn, particularly today in the dispensation of the grace of God from the Apostle Paul. That is the shield that we hold up. And that is the thing that's going to get attacked. I can assure you this. 
If you stand for Pauline truth, for Paul's message, and if you hold it up appropriately, I can promise you, that's not so much a shield, it's a big target. And it will be attacked, okay? And it, I, I heard somebody say this this week, I was listening to something, but it's amazing that we have to defend Paul's gospel. That's the only gospel you have to defend, that you really have to argue with people about. Why is that? It just might be that it just might be that you're battling spiritual wickedness in high places. And that spiritual wickedness in high places is well aware of the mystery, is well aware of what God is up to, is well aware of the will of God. Okay? And so obviously you're going to have some, some resistance there. And now today, uh, the next piece, the fifth piece in, in sort of our lineup here is the helmet of truth. But I need you to be careful here because we talked about this list and the idea that typically it, when Paul gives a list, it, there's a hierarchy to it. It's sort of in an order of importance. And so we have truth at the top of the heap and then it works its way down. And now by the time we get under the fee, fifth piece of armor, we get the helmet. Let me ask you a question. Does that mean it's not as important <laughs> it better not be. Okay, y'all turn, uh, look at verse 11 again. He says, put on what? The whole armor. Look down at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the what? Whole armor. We've mentioned this before. Again, these things are designed to work in harmony. Okay? It is designed to be a complete system of armor. Claire and I were just having a conversation about this uh, just before we walked in this morning. I can assure you one of the primary things that is going to agitate you and that is going to be a battle for you on an ongoing basis is when you can't have agreement with people and it's especially so agitating when they want to be combative with you about it and they want to disagree with you. That that is a spiritual battle, especially when it's uh, on spiritual terms, when you can't have agreement on the Word, for example. It becomes so agitating and it will beat you down. And I can assure you of this, unless you take the whole armor and use every piece to your advantage as it is laid out here, you will find yourself being broken down instead of withstanding and standing. Okay? Because it'll just chop at you, chop. It's, it's going to just... It's just going to nudge you. You know, uh, we talked about this there in verse, uh, verse 16 where it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you're able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The word darts there is the same word that's used over in Luke where Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. The word needle is the same word for darts here. And that's what it'll be like a lot of times. It'll be like just somebody coming up to you just poking you, just poking you. And you just, it's like, stop it. Poke, poke. Get, stop! And it's going to agitate you to no end. And it's fiery, by the way, so when it hits, it's just going to simmer in your skin. And it's just going to agitate. That's what this world will do to you right now. It, the world is walking according to the prince of the power of the air. Lockstep with, with all of his wishes and will. Okay, And that is entirely... Uh, counterproductive to God's will through the Apostle Paul for today. I mean, it, it's just, and it's going to drive you bananas. And so this armor is there. So we get down the list here, we get to the fifth piece of armor. Please do not think of this in terms of, well, if I don't, you know, employ that one particular day, I'll be okay. No, that'll be the day. Trust me, you get knocked upside the head, <laughs> okay? And so, it's very important. Uh, speaking in terms of importance and least importance, y'all turn back with me to 1 Corinthians 12. Keep your place there in Ephesians 6, obviously. Your Bible probably falls open to it automatically by now. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's amazing to me how many times in the Apostle Paul's writings... He really harps on this idea of unity and sameness and togetherness and the importance of the collective, okay? When we think about the armor of God, it is the same notion. It is the power of the collective um, equipment that, that is at your disposal that is going to give you what you need to be able to withstand, okay? 
I'm, I'm pulling this out of context here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul is talking about spiritual gifts and, and how they're all uh, given by God for a purpose and so that there won't be any weak points in the body of Christ. But it's the same sort of notion when we think about the armor of God. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 12. Come on down to verse 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand... I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. If I can plug some words here just a minute and take a little bit of uh, of a license here, okay? The shield cannot say to the feet, no, I got this. The breastplate can't say to the helmet, "Uh, you're good today, take a break. You've got to have it all. Come on down to verse uh, 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, for, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. It's the same with the armor of God. Uh, when the shield takes a hit, the feet rock back, the chest recoils, the head wobbles, okay? It's a, it's a holistic kind of thing. And that's why when we come back to Ephesians 6 and verse 11 and verse 13, he says, take unto you the whole armor of God. If you're missing a piece, you've got a weak point. You have, as the Bible calls it, a schism. Okay? You, you have a vulnerability. I can't say that word this morning. You have a vulnerability. Okay? And so, don't have that thing. <laughs> have it all. Have the whole armor of God on and so, um, as, we, as we make our way again to this fifth piece of armor, the helmet, it's important that even though it's the fifth piece, it is not, um, it, its importance cannot be overstated. It's very, very much needed. Um, let me say it like this. The helmet is not just important, it's necessary. Now, in the second half of that, we're going to talk about what exactly the helmet of salvation, what does that mean, what is it? Um... But it's important you know this thing has to be used and utilized. Um, y'all saw her. She started playing softball. Uh, we're, we've cranked back up in softball now. And this year, she has stepped up to a different league. Because of her age now, she has advanced to the next level of competition. Well, at her level of competition, it's no longer coach pitch and little soft pitches. Now these girls get up here like this, and they wham! And they're trying to take each other's heads off. They're, try- they're like boys too. They want to strike each other. They want to kill. They want to destroy. Now y'all look at my precious little baby. Look how delicate. Look how sweet and tender and tiny. And just, now she's a beast. Don't get me wrong. She's like, alright, come on. But look, let me tell you. When my baby gets up to bat, and I know there are missiles coming at her head, what do you think I'm making her wear? A helmet. Duh. (laughs) Right? It makes good sense. Right? So I'm going to make sure she's got a helmet on in the event that one of those things comes to her head and she's not able to dodge it. Right? It's there for protection. It's to protect the head. But now let me ask you this. In regards to the helmet of salvation, so this is something that symbolically is on the head. Let me ask you this. What is so or what makes the head so important? For most of us, Cotton. (laughs) So, all that is just a bunch of gray mush. What's so important about the head? At least in biblical terms, what's important about the head? Okay? And, And here's the reality, and we'll look at this, and we don't have time to get too deep into the weeds in this. But your head, and we're thinking in physical terms right now, but your head is the storage container of you. Okay, that's right. So, again, your head is the storage container of you, Maggie. Everything you are, however you want to define you, it's in this thing. Not my thing, your thing, right here. Okay, that's why it's important to protect this thing. If this thing is not protected, you is unprotected. Okay, now, what happens, Rita? You're in my line of sight today. Jen, Jen actually is. Trevor missed it by a hair. He's on the margin. 
Okay? And so, Jen, what happens? You're kind of in the medical kind of... You kind of... You kind of flirt with it a little bit, you know, the medical profession, pharmaceuticals and stuff. So let me ask you, you're smart. What happens if you take a major blow to the head? <laughs> Such as, give me some medical terms, I don't know, like. Which does what? Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Could cause you not to function. Hey, listen, here's what it can do. Uh, it can change your personality. Especially if you hit the frontal lobe, as I understand it. Isn't that right? Isn't this where the personality is primarily, I don't know what they use the word, what, stored, uh, programmed. It emanates from here. Look at this big forehead. This is why I have so much personality. And my hair's receding, so my personality is growing. And so if I get a blow right here, y'all are going to miss me, this version. My personality will change. That's what happens. Uh, it changes your personality and your character and it injures your ability to do all sorts of activities. Perfect example of this. Y'all, when I was in seventh grade, um, I was about Seth's size in, in seventh grade. And uh, I played football because that's what every southern boy does. You know, when you're in middle school, everybody goes out and plays football, especially in Newton because we only had like five people in our entire school. So everybody had to play, you know. Well, my coach saw fit to make me a running back. And I think it's because he thought, because I was so small, people wouldn't see me and maybe I could dodge them and, you know, get through the line and, and score a touchdown. And so I go bebopping out there, and I don't know why, but my coach used to always call this play when he would put me in, and I would have to run right through the belly of the line, right through the biggest boys in there, and right up to those linebackers and called 32 dives. That was the name of the play. I'll never forget it. And so... Uh, we were playing the Choctaws uh, one one week, and the Choctaw Indians, their 7th graders look like 17th graders. They're big, and they're like men, and had full beards in 7th grade. And so uh, so we, I get up there, and it's time he calls he a calls play and says, 32 dive, and I look at my coach like, dude, seriously. And so I get down, and he said, hut, and, and everything went in slow motion at that point. And I remember right as I got up to our offensive line, we had this dude named James Pierce, real big boy. I got right up beside his hip. And right as I got there, the linebacker from the Choctaw team met me. And I ducked my head down like that. He ducked his head down like that. And the next thing I remember was seeing blue sky and a bearded giant standing over me, one of their players, the linebacker, and he said, you need some help. And he's in seventh grade. And he helped me up to my wobbly legs. And I mean, he rung my bell. For the rest of the game, Greg Willis was not Greg Willis. I got beat to a pulp. I couldn't remember. I couldn't think. I couldn't remember. My eyes were probably dancing all over my head. And, and, and that's what happens when you sub sustain a blow to the head. It damages your ability. And so it, it, it affects your personality. It affects your character. It affects your activities. And why is that? It's because the head is the location of you. In biblical terms, let me just a real quick. This is so superficial and so surface level. Okay, y'all. Just a real quick primer on... Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? This is the body. This physical thing. Okay? Now, the Bible makes a distinction between your spirit and your soul. Spirit is literally the thing that animates the body. Okay? If you'll remember back at the beginning of creation, when God created Adam and Eve, He breathed into His nostrils the word for breath, ruach in Hebrew is when you get over in the New Testament, it's the same where we get pneuma or the Spirit. Okay, It is the breath of God. It is the thing that animates you. Once you are animated, now you have what's called a soul. The soul is the actual personality of you. Now, at death, at least today, the Spirit goes back to God because it was His to begin with. The soul is the spiritual part of you that's very much you. Okay, And it can either be saved or lost. Depending on whether that soul is saved or lost determines your destination. Okay, Now, what we're talking about here when we talk about protecting the head, 
This is, at least in biblical terms, the location of the soul, the you, the personality. And so to protect the head is to protect the soul. It is to protect everything that makes you, you. Your personality, your emotions, your thoughts, your will, all those things um, is, is all wrapped up in that soul, in that mind. You can, those are almost two synonymous things, the mind and the soul, at least in the, in the biblical sense. Um, let's look at this now. Y'all turn with me to Deuteronomy. Let's look at a few passages that help us see the importance not only of the soul and the mind, but of protecting ourselves in the, in, in the head. <laughs> uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Again, it's so important to protect the head, and the reason is because that's you. What's housed up here is the you that is you, the personality, your soul, your mind, your being, if you will. Um, I think, Rita, you mentioned this. Somebody did a minute ago. If somebody comes and you know, chops off your head, what happens to the rest of you? It's inactive. Okay, it has suddenly become mute. <laughs> Everything, it, it is now disconnected. You are unplugged, okay? Um, and so it just kind of makes sense. You want to protect this very important part of you. Deuteronomy chapter 28, look at verse 65. Deuteronomy 28, verse 65. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord, shall, the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and what? Sorrow of mind. Now, sorrow is what? It's an emotion, right? Where does the Bible here indicate that emotion emanates from? The mind. Okay? This part of your being. And I'm pointing to your head because... Generally speaking, when we think of putting on a helmet, we think of putting it over the mind. <laughs> okay, over the head, right? And so, this, this part of you is, is responsible for emotion. Things like sorrow, anger, excitement, those sorts of things. Okay, go with me to Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. At some point, what we'll do, if y'all remind me, somebody remind me, write this down. Maybe when we're finished with Ephesians, what we'll do is we'll do a study where we look at all these parts. The flesh, the body, the soul, the spirit, the heart, the mind. And we'll sort of delineate those and, and walk through Scripture. That, and that's a really interesting study. And there's, there's a lot of fine lines between those. Uh, Job, what did I say? Job chapter 23. I was talking and I didn't get there. Job 23. And look at uh, verse 13. But he is in one mind, and who can turn him? And what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. So the soul is that part of you that does what? Desires, longs for. Again, it is that emotional center. But notice, the desires then affect the doing. And so again, this is a very important and crucial part of your being, is your soul and your head. Go with me to Psalm 94. I'm just kind of walking y'all in order. Psalm 94. If you're talking about... The, this is a pet peeve of mine, by the way. If you're talking about the book of Psalms, then you say Psalms, plural. When you're pointing to one, it's Psalm, singular. Jen, did you appreciate that? That is so specific and so hair-splitting and so... Yes, OCD, I know, but that's right, it's correct, okay? <laughs> Brooke, you like it, too, you like my grammar, okay, good. Psalm 94, and look at verse 19. In the multitude of my thoughts, pause, where do your thoughts occur? Yep, up here. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my what? Soul. Now, in Hebrew poetry, what, 
what tends to happen generally on the first part of the verse, you'll get a statement, and then the second part of the verse, and if you saw this in Hebrew, you would, you would see this, the way the punctuation works. You get, there's like a comparison. So the place of the thoughts and the soul are synonymous here, okay? At least in the biblical mind, okay? So that soul controls these thoughts, okay? It is the thing that thinks in you. That, that is you, Okay? Um, and so, again, the, the soul and the mind is that part of you that it, it, it controls a lot. It even controls what you will to do. Uh, turn back with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles chapter 28. First Chronicles chapter 28 and look at verse 9. Let me pause here and say this. How many of y'all have heard this before that to be saved, it's not just about a mental acceptance. Have y'all heard that before? It's not just about accepting facts. But the reality is when you turn the Scripture, the Scripture makes a whole lot more to do about the mind and a, a willingness and an uh, uh, ability within your mind to accept truth. It's really important. And part of the reason is because there is, there's a lot of interplay between the heart and the mind. Sometimes they're almost synonymous in Scripture. This is one of those scenarios. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, look at verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing... What? What kind of mind? A willing mind. A mind that wills, okay? Uh, For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek Him, He will be found of thee. But if thou forsake Him, He will cast thee off forever. Um, Obviously, he's speaking there about Israel. But there again, the mind is something that um, is part of you that wills to do things. And then finally, go with me to uh, 2 Corinthians. Head over to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I know you guys know that the mind is important. I don't want that to be the thing that you walk away with this morning, okay? What I'm trying to do in this first session is to help you understand the significance of the helmet of salvation and just what it is protecting, why it is necessary, okay? If your mind, which is you is not guarded appropriately, what you will see about you is a wilting, is a diminishing, is a giving up. You will see a depression. You will see all kinds of anxiety and frustration. You'll be an angry person. And and I would even say this. Take time to analyze you. Take time to think about your behaviors and your thoughts and say, you know... Am I, am I depressed? Am I anxious all the time? Am I angry? What kind of emotions am I experiencing? And it may be that you have left yourself vulnerable in some areas. Okay? It may be that you have missed a piece of armor here that is designed to help give you that fortitude. Okay? It's really important. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 12. For if there be first a what? Willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. So again, the mind is this thing where you will to do things. It's, it's responsible for a whole lot. So you, your soul, your mind, this thing up here, as a person, those things, that soul and that mind is in your head. Okay? <laughs> it's in your head. So the helmet is used to protect your head, that vital part of you. Um, that is you. Now, just like softball and baseball, 
You got things like, for example, uh, football. They have unique helmets. Uh, race car drivers. You ever watch them? They're not wearing a baseball helmet when they strap into those cars going 200 miles an hour. They've got a specialized helmet. When you watch military troops march off into battle and they're going off into the field, their helmets are specialized. They have specialized gear. They're unique um, and therefore designed for a specific purpose. So doesn't it make sense that a spiritual warrior, that's us, that a spiritual warrior has a specialized helmet. And so the point I want you to understand here is that the kind of helmet matters. So what kind of helmet safeguards your personality, safeguards your zeal, and safeguards your will to live? What does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17? And take the helmet of what? What kind of helmet? The helmet of salvation, right? <laughs> that helmet of salvation is a specialized helmet. And so, here's what we're going to do. When we come back from the break, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about what in the world that means. Helmet of salvation. And then we're going to understand how specialized this thing is. All right.